Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good evening here in France, Ron and Mireille. Can, can you can you hear me, guys? I can hear you yes, very well. Okay. Thank How you are you doing up. today? I'm doing great. I'm doing very great. Well. Can't wait to share my knowledge here. So. All right. Great. So, um, welcome to all of you. I know that. Uh, you are more than 500 people that have registered from all over the world. We have more than 30 countries that are attending today. And I am so happy and so thrilled to host this webinar uh, organized by Mano Medical. So um, I will quickly introduce to you Mano Medical and then I will introduce you to Ron. Uh, Ron will do his speech and uh, feel free to ask uh, all the questions you may have uh, on your screen, on the, the right side of your screen, you can ask all the questions you want. And at the end, we'll try to answer as many of them. Mirail is the product manager of uh, Mano Medical and uh, will read all your questions. Okay, so now I'm going to share my screen and to quickly introduce uh, the company for you to understand how this works. Uh, Mano Medical is happy to uh, introduce you uh to some education um Mihail and ron can you confirm that you're seeing my uh, uh screen yes yep very good so mano medical is a company that has been uh specialized in veterinary equipment for more than 20 years and for almost five years now we've been offering to uh the veterinarians all around the world our laser therapy device but we also do uh, x-ray ultrasound endoscopy and from wherever you are in the world, I mean, we usually sell to distributors. So if you have any questions, you can also ask us, but you can also uh, talk to your distributors regarding our product. Uh, so we've been uh, uh, in the market for more than 20 years, as I already told you. We just do veterinary equipment. Uh, we have a wide range of products that we just saw before. Um, we have become, the, the leader in some distribution of equipment like blood pressure a measurement device in Europe, a laser therapy in France, and some uh, medical imaging equipment. <laughs> um, so you can see on that slide uh, all the product evolution since 1999. Uh, you will recognize so many of the products that you're using on your uh, everyday practice. Um, as you can see on that slide, on the left side of the slide, you can see uh, the laser uh, that we're offering to our customers. But today is about education because we really want with Mano Medical, together with Ron, bring as many education as we can for you. Uh, so we're not gonna talk about products today, but you can still have uh, ask your questions to your distributors or to us at the end. Today is gonna be about uh, the common companion animal applications with laser therapy by Ron. Uh, and then uh, Mano Medical is offering you solutions, uh, cost effective solutions, sustainable and practical. We have partnerships all around the world with the distributor, as I told you, but of course we sell also in France, for example, directly to veterinarians. Uh, we work with wall seller, but we also have um, agreements and partnership with pharmaceutical companies. As I told you, if you have any questions, you can write all your questions to export at manomedical.com or ask your question in the chat room on the right side uh, of your screen later on. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and I'm going to introduce you to Ron. Ron, it's a pleasure again uh, to, uh, to have you today. Um, Dr. Riegel purchased his first laser therapy in 1979, long time ago already. Run. <laughs> he co-founded the American Institute of Medical Laser Applications in 2009 to provide education on all types of medical lasers in both veterinary uh, medicine and other healthcare professions. After selling his practice where he worked for 26 years, Dr. Regal authored many papers and books on laser therapy, especially one that uh, we recommend and we gave out to all our distributors and to many veterinarians, the laser therapy in veterinary medicine photobiomodulation. Um, Dr. Regal has done hundreds of lectures nationally and internationally. Uh, today it's already the third one with us and many more will come. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today. 
I'm going to let you now run to start and uh, enjoy your webinar. All right. So you should be able to see my screen, right? Are you seeing my yes. screen? I can see it. Okay, perfect. Hold on. I got to get me out of the way. All right. <laughs> okay. So thank you for the kind words. I look forward to sharing my knowledge with everybody that's in attendance here and everybody who will see this recorded session. What I did was, is I wanted to, in a, in a reasonable amount of time, cut across all the applications for therapy, you know, laser therapy in companion animal practice. I've got a couple of equine cases in here because they're outstanding equine cases, but other than that, it's gonna show you the versatility of this modality. This modality is basically can do a lot of things. And when I first started, it was always a learning process. I would, you know, that's why I called it expect the unexpected because there's things that responded that you would just not normally think of. So I'm hoping today for those who are, you know, thinking about uh, adding a laser to their practice so they can understand the scope of the applications that can be used while you're in practice. And for those of you who already have a laser, I hope that I can expand your applications and, you know, help you take better care of your patients. So thank you, Mana Medical. I really enjoy speaking on, on your behalf and helping out my colleagues of worldwide. And again, Remy did say, you know, I founded the American Institute of Medical Laser Applications. That is my email and that is the uh, uh, logo for it. And also I'm more known for my one publication, which is this textbook by Wiley Publications. And it wasn't just myself and my co-editor, John Godbold, who contributed here. We actually had 37 people contribute chapters to this. So it's not just my opinion or Dr. Godbold's opinion, it's opinions from all over the world. We have several, actually we have a couple of, of chapters that are written by people that are from inter, in Europe. And so it's an international flavor to it. So right off the start, we'll go through some very basic fundamentals. So what does laser therapy accomplish? What does it really do? It relieves pain. In other words, it induces a short or even longer, you know, depending on the patient, a state of analgesia. It mod, you know, modulates the inflammatory response. And what do I mean by that? We still have all four stages of inflammation, but they're shorter. So the inflammatory response is, you know, somewhat under control and it increases circulation. And why are all those things important? Because I learned early on that is an acceleration of the body's natural healing. And I always felt that that was the best medicine we could practice is get the body to heal itself. So always have a diagnosis before initiation of the laser therapy. And I know that's a big statement. It's hard to get a diagnosis every time. And that, that would make us all very happy if we had a, a definitive diagnosis on every single patient that walked in the door, but we can't do that. But why that is important is we wanna make sure that we apply the laser to every area. And you're gonna hear me say this a couple of times, every area that the patient would benefit. So we want consistent clinical results. So again, you have to treat all areas that would benefit, you know, some, including compensatory. So if, uh, to use an example, if a patient has a disorder in the stifle, you should not only laser that stifle, but you should also laser the hips and, and uh, probably the apaxial muscles, you know, anywhere that they would be compensating for that disorder. And then you have to use the proper technique in order to get penetration of the photonic energy. And I covered that on a science lecture and the correct dosage. You have to have enough photons reach the target tissue so that they're absorbed. If we dose it very lightly, we found out that increasing the doses and they've gradually increased over the years that we were able to get better penetration and also more saturation of the tissue. And then you have to give the therapy often enough. It's a little difficult during COVID times here, but you got to remember that that uh, you know you have to do it consistently because laser therapy is cumulative in effect. In other words, you should get a big wow after the first one or two treatments. My logo is better in four or treat them no more. That means you're pointing it at the wrong place. So hopefully that never happens to you, but it happened to me several times. But you should get a wow right off the bat, and then you'll continue to build on that because you've stimulated the body to heal itself, and continual stimulation you know, basically ups the metabolic rate every time you administer therapy. So look at these. These are the common conditions that we normally see in the United States in, in daily practice. This was compiled by Banfield, which is a corporate-owned 
you know, I think they have several hundred uh, clinics in the United States. And, and this is in order of descending, you know, incidents that they're seeing every day. And is there, you know, dental conditions, ear disorders, skin conditions, you know, musculoskeletal, orthopedic, you know, urinary GI systems, all those things. And is there anything on that list that you think you cannot use laser therapy for? Anything. And you're all going to answer me vaccinations why would i vaccinate in fact you should not vaccinate over you know la apply laser therapy over a vaccination but in all my years of practice unfortunately i've seen a couple of incidences where the animal did react locally to a vaccine and the laser did help it you know keep that inflammation or adverse reaction down to a minimum uh, i actually tried it on myself when i received the covid vaccination i you know, I'm kind of a big baby and my arm hurt really badly the next day and I lasered over that. And of course I had the, you know, within an hour or so, a lot of recovery, a lot of, you know, relief of that pain. So vaccinations are something that you not do regularly on a routine basis, but you do do that if there's a reaction. And I, I actually kept uh, the one case that I had that's very severe off the slides because it's a, it's a sad, sad case that's happened there. But when I talk about dosages and I talk about application and I talk about you know the length of time or what wattage or anything, I'm gonna give you the dosages here, but rest assured that Mano Medical software is really up to date. And this is one of their screens. And basically on this screen, you choose, it's very simple to use. It's intuitive to use. This laser, I'm sure all of you could just get out of the box and without a whole lot of instruction, you're gonna be able to administer your first laser therapy just by following the screens. So on this, I would pick the canine species, and then it would ask me whether it's an acute or chronic condition. And then it would ask me, you know, what musculoskeletal area that it do, and here I pick the back. And then I put the dog's weight in there. And what happens is, is then the uh, software calculates a treatment for you. It gives you the optimal power, and this is a place to start. It gives you optimal power. Uh, you know, it'll emit some in continuous wave, it'll emit some at different frequencies. And again, it will apply enough energy to sufficiently treat that disorder on the average patient. So again, the software provides an easy guideline to initiate therapy. And with their software, you can also keep records on this software and keep track of the patients you're treating. So let's talk about acute conditions first. We're gonna go through acute conditions, several of the most common, and then we're gonna go through some uh, periprocedural conditions that you can use it for. I bet you know there's very few of you that are using it during surgery. Of course, you're always worried about sterile technique, but I'm gonna tell you about that in a little bit. And then we're gonna go through some chronic conditions and show you what you should expect. So in acute condition, you're going to treat it, when we talk about frequency of treatment, you're gonna treat it till it's resolved or till it's at least recovered enough that you know it doesn't need any more treatment. That could be you know, an aggressive treatment that's daily, that could be every other day, it could be twice a week, and a lot of that has to do with logistics. How often can the client bring the animal to see you for therapy? So again, treat it till resolution of the condition, and the biggest thing that we're going to do, and this is what lasers do, is they provide analgesia. So right off the bat, it's an acute pain management. It should be part of your pain management program. So musculoskeletal pain, back pain, you know, sprains, strains, that kind of thing. Dermatological, anything that ends in itis is inflammation. And again, on those, those uh, functions that I started with at the beginning of the lecture, you can see that it, it basically modulates that inflammatory reaction. And then gastrointestinal pain. A lot of you probably didn't realize that you can apply this to the abdomen, especially when you have gastritis or colitis, pancreatitis even. There's been many a successful treatment of pancreatitis. Is it true for every case? No, absolutely not. But it is an effective relief of pain. And if you don't believe me, next time you have you know, a gastrointestinal disorder, try lasering yourself and see what the difference that would make, but give yourself the right dosage. So again, urinary pain, cystitis, we're gonna talk about that here in a little bit. And again, those animals are always painful. So not only are we accelerating the body's ability to heal the metabolic rate of the target cells, but we're also providing an analgesia effect. And honestly, to go through that biochemical cascade of events that takes an hour itself. So I'm just gonna leave it at pain management there. So let's talk about superficial here, dermatological applications. This, this patient is a 12 month old male boxer. He had severe generalized demodex. And of course the secondary staph and, and bacterial infection, he was very depressed. The, the, what made this case significant is this is the initial image of him. Now he had already gone 
through two rounds of systemic treatment. And it was basically as soon as the systemic treatment was over, he'd come right back with the Demodex. The Demodex would flare up again, as you can see. And that's what his feet looked like initially. So we started to dose him with a, a frequency of daily for a few days and, and uh, whatnot. And after one week, after four therapy sessions, that's the results we have. And I hope everybody can see that. I hope there's no picture of me blocking the way or anything like that down in the corner. I don't know where my photo is right now. But anyway, you can see that there's a big difference in just one week after four therapy sessions. And then lo and behold, you know, that's again, after one week, after five weeks post and only 10 therapy sessions. So again, aggressively treating and then reducing the frequency of treating once you see that the dog's starting to heal. In five weeks post 10 therapy sessions, he was almost completely cleared up. In fact, so much so it did not reoccur. So simply adding laser therapy to the, you know, regular standard of care, regular pharmaceutical approach, you have an added effect, you have a, a basically something that will actually help this patient heal. Pododermatitis, you know, something very simple that we see in practice all the time, at least we do here in the States, but sometimes very difficult to clear up because of the location of the dermatitis. It's in the, you know, between the pads and the foot. So that's a hard area to treat. You put something topical on there, what happens? The dog licks it off, or he walks around and it goes on the carpet or it goes on the yard or whatever. But if you use photobiomodulation or laser therapy on that, this is six therapy sessions at a low dose of two joules per square centimeter after 16 days. So again, this patient got treated three times the first week, you know, three times uh, the second, you know, second week and at 16 days when he came in for the next therapy, that's what it looked like. Does he need any more therapy? No. Now, he did not have anything topical once he had started the laser therapy. They just didn't. They did treat him with systemic medications, but nothing topical on that. That's all laser therapy that did that. Pyotraumatic dermatitis, this is day one, and this is a Labrador retriever with a hot spot at the base of the tail. The area was clipped, you know, and, uh, you know, scrubbed, and then it was treated with three joules per square centimeter. The uh, return for treatment on days three and four couldn't come in the next day, and no topical treatment was used on this. These are usually do respond well to topical treatment because the topical can stay on there. And after three days, look at that. Look at the change in the inflammatory reaction there. Look at how the lesion has shrank. Look how it doesn't look angry anymore. And that makes for a very satisfied client. So again, this was on day four, and as you can see, that was the end of the therapy. We only needed three treatments. We've turned that around. The, the patient is healing himself, stopped licking, stopped, you know, basically had, you know, you could see the swelling go out of the area, all those. Fernunculosis, this is a nine-year-old Labrador, incessant licking in a wound for one week. And the wound was treated twice over three days with a very small dosage, three joules per square centimeter. And the time to treat this is just minutes. You know, so with the, the mano laser, the mano medical laser, you can administer this treatment in a very short period of time and do a really good job at it. And within 48 hours, the licking had, licking had almost completely stopped and the ulcerated surface had shrunk about half and with market epithelialization. And again, no further treatments was necessary. And that's just in three days. So again, you know, really good response um, to therapy. Otitis externa and interna. Now, laser therapy allows not only treatment of the external structures, you think, well, you know, I have trouble getting the light into the canal of the ear there because of all the purulent discharge, all the junk that's inside the ear. And even if you clean it out, it's hard to get penetration down through the ear. Well, with Mano Medical's handpiece that has a rollerball into it, you can treat them on contact and you can actually treat the inside of the ear externally. So you're basically going to, you know, have them, you know, treat it both internally, you're going to treat the pin of the ear, but then you're going to pull on the pin of the ear, straighten the ear canal out, palpate it, and then basically treat the entire canal as much as you can, pointing the photonic energy at every possible direction. You're still going to use, you know, traditional, you know, topical medications. You still may even use uh, systemic medications, but, you know, you will see a big difference in single treatment. This is something that responds like, say, 90 to 95% after one treatment. And of course, more involved cases, those chronic ones that come in, the Basset Hounds that you see or the Cocker Spaniels you see on almost a monthly basis, they're going to take more than one treatment to treat. But I'm going to give you an example here. This is a dog that had otitis in both ears, and you can see it's both externa and interna. And you can see that, and then you can see, 
the application of laser therapy under uh, regular photography, infrared light uh, shows up as blue. So those that is, and, and uh, again, you're shooting the external of the ear there. And then again, this is what it looked like after six treatments over 12 days. Do you think that made for a very happy client? Now his ears were upright. He didn't have that floppy ear that gives you that warm, moist, dark area that bacteria and fungi and yeast love. But anyway, we completely cleared him up. And again, this was an acute case. So we treated him till it was, you know, basically uh, cured. This is another case. This is three treatments over four days. And this was more of an interna than externa. And again, that you saw the, the uh, the response there, again, very good. And again, we treated both the external off contact and the internal part of the ear on contact. And there you can see day nine after six therapy sessions. And look how clean that ear looks. There is no discharge whatsoever. It's dry, you know, and the dog's not shaking his head. He's not uncomfortable from it anymore. Anal sacculitis. I picked a lot of things that we see on a regular basis. Ruptured anal sac. Again, this area was clean. The sac was expressed of all material. Dosage three to four joules per square centimeter. I just put the wattage up there. Uh, the again, the software will help you decide what wattage when you put the basically the weight and the, the unique characteristics of your patient. And he returned the following day for follow up. Now he had nothing else. He just basically was cleaned up, expressed, clipped up, washed, and lasered. And that's what it looked like on the second day. So that's pretty. You know, even though this is an N1 case, that is bona fide proof that laser therapy accelerates the healing process. Because look how that has changed. The swelling's down, the redness is gone. You know, we are well on the way to healing there. Now, traumatic acute wounds. I probably have probably close to 100 wound cases in my laptop. But I like this one because this was when little dog meets large dog. This dog basically was in a fight and the other dog basically degloved all the skin over his abdomen, over his body. And of course they went to the emergency room and again, they sewed him up. They set the record for the amount of drains they can put in a wound, as you can see. And we all know what the problem is here. We're all waiting for this and you know, trying to do everything we possibly can do to keep this from dehissing. And so again, it was treated, you know, while it was being sutured up. And then, you know, we were gonna treat it every day, additional treatments daily or at each bandage change, but it's seven days, you know, that's what it looked like. So this patient was at a facility where they did have some student help and they made them, me you know, measure the epithelial migration and actually take rulers. And they measured six different places on this wound and measured the closure rate of the epithelial migration. And the normal is one millimeter a day. On this one, at three to four, after administering three to four joules per square centimeter over this area, they actually felt that with all their measurements that they had almost double, you know, at least one and a half times that epithelial migration rate, okay? So this is 56 days after 14 therapy sessions. So as you can see again, now, did that dog receive topicals? Yes. Did that dog receive systemic medication? Yes. Was it, you know, seen, you know, 14 times over the two month period? Yes. And he was seen, you know, rather aggressively at first and then tapered off until, you know, the, the, the problem was resolved. But this is always a good indication that even your, your hardest cases, laser therapy will add quite the tool to your toolbox here to help manage these cases. This is another case that was given to me. And again, all the uh, people that contributed these cases to me, they're listed on the slides and I've been neglecting mentioning them, but this is Dr. Dunbar's case in Montreal. And again, this was a seven month old male miniature schnauzer. And he's presented October 12th, 1012, uh, October the 5th and 10, 2020, 2012, wow. Bitten on the nose by a larger older dog three days ago. That's what they thought. They thought that they did have a big dog. They did fight and this was a puppy. So the dog, they felt that this damage to his nose, but he had a month history of not feeling well, decreased appetite and a physical exam and vaccination two months ago at Dr. Dunbar's clinic was everything was normal two months ago. So this is his initial presentation. This is how he presented at Dr. Dunbar's uh, office on the, October the 5th. Now she was very, you know, worked up the case very well and she took a radiograph there. And some of you can probably already recognize what the real culprit here is. It was not a bite from the other dog. It was a rubber band. 
The people neglected to tell Dr. Dunbar that they also ran a daycare facility at their home and took care of a number of small children. And here, one of the kids had put a rubber band around that busy place, busy household. They didn't notice it until, you know, wonder why he was, you know, off his food for a month. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? I mean, that's the ultimate diet. Put a rubber band around your mouth and you won't be, you won't gain any weight. Poor thing. Of course, as soon as this was removed surgically, he, he immediately he regained his appetite, let me tell you. But this is after two treatments on day three. Again, we saw him on, you know, on the, on the fifth. So three days post, two treatments. So he's had a, you know, a treatment the, initially and then the day before, and then this is before the third treatment. Used a rather high dose here, eight joules per square centimeter, even though it seems like a superficial condition because of the depth of the damage to the tissue in this area. And again, this is day five following the third uh, laser therapy session. And you can see how well that is, you know, the inflammation has gone out, the swelling's gone out. I know removal of the rubber band had a lot to do with that, but still you, I can absolutely guarantee you that this is a lot to do with the laser therapy. I don't think he would have responded as well without adding laser therapy. And this is day seven after five laser therapy sessions. And he also, by the way, gained three pounds in that in one week. So he started eating quite robustly again. So this is a case from a colleague in uh, the state next to mine, Indiana. And again, this is a two-year-old pug and he came in with this nice fracture. This is his initial radiographic uh, study. And due to the economics, they opted for external fixation with a metasplint. They just did not have the money to do you know, a proper orthopedic procedure where you put a plate on it, put a pin in it or whatever you would do. And they felt, you know, that's the, what the, one of the choices they were given and that's what they could afford to do. So that's what they did. And of course, we all know with a metasplint, you know, it just does not oppose the bones as well. The healing is not well, but also we have other factors into play here. And you can see after, you know, a period of time here that this was a non-union. This was not going to grow together. And look at the radiographs there compared to the initial ones. So all this time we've had the splint on there. So Dr. Kim called me and she said, can we laser this? And she said, I don't know how to laser it, except when I change the bandage, when I change the splint, I said, make a window in it, cut a window in it, and then angle your handpiece at all different directions right over the fracture. And she did that. So she made a window in the metal splint and therapy applied at all angles twice a week for five weeks at eight joules per square centimeter. And after five weeks and only 10 sessions, look what we have. And why? Because of all the biochemical cascade of events, we've got angiogenesis and a reduction of edema. And again, we basically made for a better heal. We not only stimulated the, the tissue to heal, we also provided a better healing environment for it to heal by providing more blood supply. So again, no results for that period of time and then added laser therapy to the program through a, the window nonetheless, and that's the results we got. This is a dorsal cortical stress fracture on a, on a thoroughbred that was in training. Again, this was treated. They did, you know, normally we put a screw in this, but they didn't want to, you know, they didn't think that this horse had real high hopes of making any money at the racetrack. So they decided to just laser it instead. And again, three to four joules per square centimeter, treating it off contact at first because it was painful. You couldn't hardly treat it on contact. And again, treatment two to three times a week. It was at the racetrack, so it was easy to accessible when we was there when we were there every day to be able to offer this treatment. And it was treated at bandage change or splint change or through the window that we made. And we did all kinds of different things to this. And you could see the healing in just 30 days. This was the case on March the 10th, and this was a long time ago. I almost uh, hate to think it was like probably 2007, 2006. This was my epiphany case. I was looking at different lasers at that time and the, the more high, the ones with higher power had just come started to come out. And again, you know, this was an eight year old warm blood show jumper was presented with an acute right forelimb lameness. And again, this was the, the ultrasound study that I got. Look at that, it's terrible. And you know, what are you gonna do with this? I mean, yeah, back in those days, we did not have the stem cells, the PRP and all the things at our disposal. We had basically stall rest, which I hated, because the horse was made to walk around all day. So we started lasering it. And we, you know, again, this was what we had in 30 days. And that horse went back to the same level of competition. What I want you to notice there is this does accelerate the healing because what's noticeably absent on the recovery ultrasounds, no scar tissue. So what the problem with these is they scar in 
And then when the horse jumps again or performs again, he has the inelastic tissue there and tears again. This one did not. This one went on to a very illustrious career. And this was after 16 therapy sessions over that period of time. So let's talk about, we talked about some of the cross cut of acute disorders. Let's talk about periprocedural conditions here. And again, this is a single post procedure treatment with minimal incision and you just laser the incision. I have one surgical practice said, well, you know, our incisions heal fine. I said, okay, don't believe me, but go ahead and laser half the incision and not the other half and compare in four days what your incision looks like. And the after within a week, they had added two therapy lasers to their hospital. So again, multiple daily or every other day treatments with greater, you know, when you have greater tissue damage, when you're sewing up a bad wound, like our case earlier, or, you know, when you just have a straight incision from a routine surgery, that, you know, benefits also. And again, consider treatment before procedures. There's actually evidence in the literature that treatment before an incision basically cut down the recovery time and also the patient was in less pain after those were human subjects. So dose here is very superficial, we can see it, so we don't have to dose it very highly, three to four joules per square centimeter, non-contact because you wanna keep, you know, you don't, you know, surgeons don't like when you start pushing on their incision line and you treat the incision as well as the surrounding border of normal tissue. And usually single poke, post-op treatment, every, you know, a lot of practices, the majority of them have started to use that as part of their multimodal pain management for recovering from surgery. So oral surgery, that's easy. I mean, we can get the laser right in there. Most of the patients will, you know, after an extraction in this case, will allow, you know, you to laser them post-extraction and maybe even a couple of times after that. Gingivitis here, you can treat them with the mouth closed or open. When you have the on-contact handpiece on the laser, you actually get penetration of the tissue, you know, through that tissue to your target tissue of the gingiva. And again, you have to increase the dose. Again, mouth open, I used three to four joules per square centimeter. When it was closed, I used eight to 10. Mouth open, of course, it's off contact because the patient would really object to you putting a contact handpiece on that excision site. But again, here, on, you know, on contact with the mouse closed. And again, you treat the, the, the target and the surrounding tissue. And this is the before and after for periodontal disease. And again, you can see the results. We cleaned the teeth, but you can see how the inflammation has gone out of the gingiva. Again, how about when you're doing a bowel anastomosis? You will actually, you know, you treat it just like any superficial condition. You're gonna use non-contact and you're gonna go right over your incision line and you can treat your surgical incision site as like you would treat a wound. And you can do it intraoperatively. And what you're going to see, and which what I noticed right off the bat, was is an increased circulation. You can actually see the vasculature increase. It basically, it, you know, from being pale and, and, uh, you know, it doesn't look like it has good circulation. You can see it, you know, basically re be reestablished right before your eyes. And again, it's a part of a non-optional pain management procedure because, again, this can only help. So you put the bowel back in where it belongs, and then you close the incision, and then you laser the incision. Now, on the case on the right, this is, you know, this bladder incision. A lot of bladders, when you get them out, are angry. They look very red. They're very inflamed, and you will actually see them pink up. Some of the inflammation will go up off while you're administering it. And again, it's very superficial and you're not contaminating your site. You're not, you know, basically doing an, a, a contaminated surgery here. You're keeping it off, off um, contact and you're keeping it far away, enough away that you're not introducing any foreign substances or anything else to that surgical procedure. Intraoptical musculoskeletal, this is when you're doing orthopedic surgery or something like that. You're gonna treat, again, the areas, you know, a lot of those things are very traumatic to the surrounding tissues when you're putting plates on and pins in and everything else. And I've done that many a time. And again, you're gonna be non-contact or maintain a sepsis and you're going to treat the surgical site as a wound and intraoperal treat for the surgical site and immediately post-op. And then addition as you know, needed for, for rehabilitation. So here's treatment you know, before we close the skin on the you know closure of the of the tissues there, and then this is a basically the incision on a on a patient afterwards, and you can see that you know even though we have metal staples in there, that doesn't matter. Metals only reflects light; it does not absorb it. And again, then we do additional treatments as part of the multimodal pain management and rehabilitation project. So again, it's unique to each patient how many times you're going to do it and how often you should do it. Chronic pain management. So we're going to talk about some chronic cases now. Now, you know, hopefully no, none of you ever see the 
set of hips that are on that radiograph, but osteoarthritis, chronic dermatological conditions, respiratory conditions, and chronic GI conditions. So I'm going to go through some case example of those. So the goal of any chronic condition is to improve and maintain patient's quality of life. This is a you know, are gonna have three phases to it. Instead of just an aggressive phase, we're gonna have an aggressive phase where we treat it just like it's an acute injury or an acute disorder. And then we're gonna have a transitional phase where we gradually reduce the, the treatment frequency. Then we have a maintenance phase where we treat as needed to maintain the effect of our original treat. So we, we get them to a level that we like and then we maintain it there. That's the, that's the key. And each patient will be different. You will not have, you know, and after you get confidence and you're, you know, fairly, at ease using the laser, you'll know approximately how many treatments it'll take, how often they have to come in. A lot of times I'd let the owners decide that for me. We're gonna come back to that case here in a little bit. Lick granulomas, when we first started treating those eight, nine years ago, we treated them as a superficial condition, three to five joules per square centimeter, nine no. Those images are not, those pictures on the right are not a real lick granuloma that you get all excited about. But again, this is six treatments over three weeks. It took for that to clear up at five joules per square centimeter. Then we got a little smarter uh, as time went on, we increased the dosages to these, and this is four treatments over two weeks of 15 joules per square centimeter, so three times the dose. And you can see the response there is much better. We're even getting hair growth coming back there. And then again, right now, the consensus is a dosage of about 30 joules per square centimeter. I've used up to 40 when it was really bad. And what you wanna see is you wanna see that cessation of licking that uh, basically I think we get a serotonin release from that and it you know, basically helps that dog with an obsessive compulsive disorder that forces them to lick these lesions. And again, this was six treatments over 18 days and you can see that's quite improved. Is it finished yet? No. Do they come back after you've cleared this one up in another anatomical area? Most of the time. So again, osteoarthritis, here's another whole hour of lecture on its own on using laser therapy to treat this. Again, pain management, you get a reduction in interleukin-1. You know, it regrowth and replicates the chondroblast. And you know, you get an increased nitric oxide levels, especially in the older patients where those nitric oxide levels are low. And again, so there's a lot of biochemical cascade of events that happen when you're treating osteoarthritis with the laser, but you are helping managing pain, you're helping reducing the inflammation, you're gonna help reduce the swelling in the area and provide a better environment for this to you know, exist and provide a higher quality of life for these chronic patients. So let's talk about getting laser therapy into one of these chronic joints. Again, you can see the stifle's not uh, in very good shape here, but we need to get penetration into that joint. We can't just basically put it on contact. Sometimes those are painful and you can't put it on contact, but you wanna make sure that you treat it circumferentially around the entire joint. Even though you might know radiographically the lesions in this one quadrant, but you still wanna treat it because you want light to hit every possible target cell in that area. So you treat it that, and then also you put it through passive range of motion. Just think how many more areas will be exposed when I have that joint inflection versus extension. And again, this is being treated in standing position. No, you put them in a lateral recumbency because when they're standing, they're using their blood supply to support their weight. So this is application technique is important for, you know, to get that penetration into the joint and get optimal results from your laser therapy. So again, you wanna put them in lateral recumbency and then you can put them through passive range of motion very easily and treat the entire joint. So here's our geriatric feline cat again. This is a, a case that was actually contributed by my co-editor on the book, Dr. John Godbold, a 16 year old uh, domestic short haired, six and a half pounds. He had chronic renal disease, a chronic renal failure, loss of muscle mass and coordination, chronic arthritis throughout. So how do you help this cat? You can't hardly give him anything systemic, why? Because it's gonna affect his renal function and his digestion. He's gonna, basically you give him something orally, he's gonna hand it back to you by throwing it up in a very short period of time. So again, we wanna treat them with laser therapy here. It's non-invasive and it can only help them. So again, aggressive on this case was every other day treatment until a response was noted, which did not take long because actually this case responded to the first treatment. If the clients, you know, you get client feedback and they noticed that this was doing very well after the very first treatment. We used a little higher dose because of his thick haircut and we coat and we treated him off contact. He did not like it when we rubbed the contact hand piece on his, directly on his skin. 
And so once a response is noted, you begin to reduce the frequency of treatments and he maintained it every three to four weeks. And on this one, trust the owner's observations of the patient at home to determine maintenance, you know, treatment frequency. In other words, I would know in about a month if I had not seen this patient myself, I would have had my somebody in my office call and say, you know, hey, how's, you know, how's your pet doing? And they would say, oh, yeah, I need to come in. I just haven't had time, you know, and then that reminds them to come back in and get that maintenance dose where they, you know, you don't regress back to where you started from. A collapsed intervertebral disc space, again, 16-year-old poodle, marked lumbar pain, but no neurological deficits, collapsed L4 and 5, as you can see on the radiographs here. Uh, you know, sclerotic changes. Again, this is a Dr. John's case here. And again, this is going to help with the pain. It's anti-inflammatory and analgesic in effects. They also put the, you know, the patient on systemic analgesics and anti-inflammatories, but they were stopped as soon as we started because the dog was vomiting and would not eat. So again, these clients then opted. They said, okay, we'll bring him in, you know, fairly often to do this laser therapy on it because this was a case way back in the you know, basically around 2010 when it wasn't as well known at that time. So they initiated it as an alternative to medication, but I don't think it should ever be called an alternative. It should be, you know, first choice as part of your regular plan. Six treatments every other day with a nine joules per square centimeter, and then he was maintained very comfortably every three to four weeks for another two years. Feline lower urinary tract disease. This success of treatment of this is determined by its application. So if you lay the cat on his back and you try to treat him, where's my target? All the way up at the spine. So if I put the handpiece in contact with the dermis in his you know, pelvic area, I'm not really hitting that target as well as I can when I make the cat stand up in this way, in this fashion, and put the handpiece right under. The, the, my target is the lower urinary tract is right at the end of the handpiece on this. Again, higher dosage because we're trying to saturate a lot of tissues. We're trying to saturate through liquids and all kinds of other substances in the abdomen there. And again, our target tissues are the neurological supply to these structures and all anatomical structures. So a lot of times we found an effect uh, on some of the older patients to laser also their spinal cord and follow the dermatome pattern of the nerve down to the urinary system, and that helped. And acute cases benefit from treatment twice daily. That's the only time you're gonna ever hear me say that. I tried to treating a lot of things two times a day, and it did not really seem to help except in these instances here. How about feline asthma? This is from a colleague in Norway, and he shared this with Dr. Godbold on one of our speaking tours. And again, pain relief, reduction of inflammation, and improved quality of life. Again, six to eight joules per square centimeter, a frequency three out of first four days and three times per week, then once a week till managed. And this is the responded, you know, pretty fast and that's the radiograph and showing how much of that inflammation and congestion has disappeared from the lungs after therapy. Feline chronic renal disease. I bet you know there's very few of out there that have used laser therapy for this. And again, it's not a single disease. It's not a single condition. There's all kinds of things. And you know, 50% of our cats over in this country in their geriatric years over 15 have it and we provide a lot of palatable palliative care for them. But again, you know, just think of how the actions of the laser work. They cause vasodilation. So they're reducing that you know, glomerular pressure. They're doing all kinds of things here. They're increasing the circulation. They're increasing, you know, basically helping the metabolic rate of some of the cells here. So it really, really does work for this. Now, how do you do it? You basically two to three joules per square centimeter because our target's right underneath the handpiece and over the kidney tissue at all angles, at least three vertebrae above and below. And then I, you know, Dr. Ron also, also, you know, suggested treating the inguinal popliteal and all the lymph nodes associated with it. Now, I was so confident in this, I have treated three renal failure cases in the equine. And again, large doses and everything, but all three have responded. Actually, the one was a Cushing's horse. And actually, that spring was the first time that horse had shed out his winter coat in three years. So don't tell me that the light, you know, the, the, uh, Photobiomodulation is not going on within those tissues. And again, how often do you do it on these cases of, of renal failure in the cat and the dog, for a matter of fact, is dependent on the blood chemistry results, twice daily for three days and twice weekly for two weeks and once a week as maintenance, whatever you see needs fit. So let's talk about, you know, again, another case of IV 
IVDD, intervertebral disc disease. And again, this uh, doctor in Long Island, New York, used thermography to localize the area. In other words, this is a roadmap where to apply laser therapy. So he knew by that image that that white and red area all needed to receive laser therapy. And he had a definitive diagnosis on this case. And again, it'll reduce the pro-inflammatory cytokines and reactive oxygen species that infiltrate the spinal cord and stimulate you know, neuronal sprouting and regrowth of several axons. And Draper's paper in 2012 was won by the University of Florida, and it showed a reduction in time to ambulation in the group receiving that versus otherwise. Again, how do we do it? We treat large areas. You know, if you don't have thermography equipment to pinpoint, give you a roadmap, you treat every possible, possible way and try to angle the, the beam at every possible way to hit the target tissues. And again, you're going to use a variance of dose that will be determined by the software in your in your laser and then dorsal lateral approach towards the intervertebral foramen directly on the spinous processes. Now, how about neurological applications? How many are doing that? Traumatic brain injury, cognitive dysfunction syndrome, and the big one that's been proven in several papers that have come out just in the last couple of years on degenerative myopathy. Traumatic brain injury, one word of caution, make sure they have stopped hemorrhaging when you start to treat them, because if you don't, they will hemorrhage more, and that would be a disaster. So high dosages, very really slow, emitted at a frequency, two to eight joules per square centimeter over the entire cranium, every 12 to 24 hours, and you will see a difference. And again, it decreases the intracranial inflammation, decreases the oxidative stress, stabilizes these tissues, and you know prevents cellular apoptosis. So again, cellular death. Cognitive dysfunction syndrome, that's basically similar to Alzheimer's disease. And again, what do you do for these? You know, it is characterized by oxidative stress and mitochondrial dysfunction. And what does a laser do? It, it's, it's target areas of mitochondria. So why would you not want to try this? And again, you use a varying amount of dosages that are in the literature. And again, you'll know in one week, you know, within two weeks, whether it's really helping or not. Twice a week for two weeks, you know, daily, however you see fit to frequency, and you get slow over the dorsal surface of the skull, booting both the right and left hemispheres and the base of the skull. Degenerative myopathy, I helped with the study that was put out by a rehab center in New England. And again, difficult to diagnose and obtain, you know, to obtain and difficult for the owner to accept. And it's a non-inflammatory inflammatory axonal degeneration of T3 through S, you know, the sacrum, the third vertebra, the third vertebrae of the sacrum. And again, these these patients suffer terribly. And again, this can only help them. It's providing increased cellular respiration, increased blood flow to these muscles, and pain relief. You know, they think, well, these dogs aren't in a lot of pain. Well, you see the difference when you laser them. You'll see it right afterwards. You'll have an initial wow. And it slows the degeneration of the muscle on the cellular level. How do I know this? The Kaufman study. Kathman study rather, we had, uh, you know, with physical therapy, had longer, you know, survival time with a mean of 255 days, compared to the amount that did not physiotherapy to a mean of 55 days with those that did. So we reduced that rehabilitation by 200 days in a large group of animals. There was 40 animals on this study. Nasal aspergillosis. I mean, this is something I hope you never run into. This is a four-year-old Rottweiler. He was diagnosed in January of 2010. Again, destructive rhinitis of the right sinus, just culture revealed, we knew exactly our definitive diagnosis. Two, in, you know, Initially, he was treated with two intranasal antifungal infusions as well as systemic medications for over two years with minimal improvement. So again, this thing, his quality of life by 2013 was just terrible and he was presented for euthanasia. And here's Evo. And you can see these before pictures are not pretty. And you can see why, you know, the people were considering euthanasia. So the doctor in this case decided that, you know, what do we got to lose here? Let me see if the laser will do anything for that. So there's him, you know, again, after he's been clipped and cleaned up. So you can see the extent of the lesion there. Dosage, four to six joules per square centimeter off contact at first and then on contact three times weekly for four weeks. So we did do him 12 weeks here, but that's what we got after 24 treatments. And that is the same dog. You'll accuse me of switching dogs on this, but I did not. So it's no longer does laser therapy photobiomodulation work. It's now, what new applications can we use it on? And I learn something almost every week. Some colleague calls and I will, you know, they'll ask me a question and I'll turn it around and say, okay, what's the coolest thing you've ever seen? What's the biggest response you've ever seen? And that's how we have learned to expand the applications of this. And I have just 
touched the tip of the iceberg in this lecture. There's a lot of cases. As you go through what you see on a daily basis, just think how many would not have benefited from laser therapy if they were in for any kind of disorder. You know, most of them. So again, you have a return on investment here and you're doing, you know, you're basically raising the quality of medicine that you're practicing and the quality of life of your patients. So any questions right now, we're open to questions right now. And there's also my email address again, in case we don't get to your question. So colleagues, are there any questions that have come in? Uh, yes, so thank you very much, Ron, for this uh, extremely informative lecture. It is a Amazing. pleasure you as usual. And, uh, Amazing. I, I can't believe the last case was, I mean, you yeah, can't believe that this is the same dog, in fact. That's right. You know, I right? <laughs> believe me, if I wouldn't have known the case personally, I probably would have the same question in my mind. That's not the same dog. Oh. But if you look at the cataracts in his eyes, he has the same cataracts that he had in the original images, the original pictures. So, but the reason I have all this information is, is I'm old. I've been around the block a few times. I've traveled the world. And, and luckily, all our colleagues are with basically sharing their knowledge. And I now it's, you know, basically my turn every opportunity I get to share it with you. So, yes. And again, I have many, many more cases. We can spend a lot of time going through these and how it works. But go ahead. Any questions? Uh, yeah, we actually have some. So just before <laughs> answering all the questions, uh, please uh, uh, let me know. Uh, know that uh, this uh, webinar will be available on uh, our YouTube channel, on uh, so you can check for the Manu Medical YouTube channel on YouTube. And if you have any questions regarding the uh, laser device itself, then you can send your emails to export at manumedical.com. Uh, and uh, so now. Let us uh, answer some questions regarding the clinical aspect. Uh, so one question is, uh, is there still any concern that laser application over an infected wound could worsen the condition? Or has that been debunked already? All right, that's a very good question that I get all the time. And the reason is, is that it, it basically, you're, you're basically allowing the body, you're increasing the immune response to that infection and everybody thinks, well, if I if I laser over bacteria, a bacterial culture, you know, won't that make the bacteria grow more? It makes the tissues and the cells grow more. What's the difference? Just think, and you know the answer already. It's like a, a slap in the face when I thought of this because I didn't realize that at first either. When way back in the day, when this was a concern, it's no longer a concern. And why? Bacterial yeast, fungi, they have no mitochondria, so they cannot respond to the light, so they cannot get an increased metabolic rate. So they don't respond, but it does cause a response by the body to fight that infection off faster. Mm. Thank you, Ron. That's, uh, that is uh, a question that uh, I already had on other occasions. And uh, thank you very much for your answer for this one. Uh, now, uh, you have, a, uh, have another question. I don't think that you mentioned anything regarding acupuncture or trigger points. Mm. Is something that uh, yep. can be done also oh that's that's another excellent question and that's actually you know if i had more time we would have covered that because laser puncture has been well documented and, and used a lot i actually use it you know in conjunction with treating the localized area i would treat the reactive ac acupuncture points trigger points you can understand how that would benefit you treat them on contact and you basically use the circle to dragon technique rotating the on contact handpiece in a small circle around that area and you will actually feel those trigger points that tissue relax it will basically you know that that little lump that little spasm area between the nerve and the muscle tissue will actually relax and disappear underneath the handpiece so it stimulate acupuncture points on the dog uh, the chi institute down in florida which has graduated over 6,000 veterinarians in acupuncture basically feel that it takes about 20 to 25 joules to stimulate most acupuncture points on the canine, about 15 joules to stimulate most acupuncture points on a feline, about anywhere from 100 to 200, so a big range on the equine. And again, it depends on the depth of the point. You know, gallbladder 25 is a fairly deep point, so it, you know, it takes a little bit more energy. So the answer to your question is yes, it does help and it does work. And uh, there's actually a study coming out there right now where 
they used a uh, acupuncture and, and laser puncture to stimulate acupuncture points and measured the change in circulation in their feet. So interesting, going to come out here in the next year. Thank you, Ron. So another question is a very practical one. How do you actually calculate the dosage for the treatment? Okay. Well, again, if it's superficial, you don't need a high dose. So I'm going to give it in general terms first, and I'm going to narrow it down. So if I can see it, I only need a superficial dose, which on most of your companion animals is anywhere from two to five, six joules per square centimeter. And this is determined basically, I determined it by trial and error. And then we had, you know, along the way here, we did research on with photometers and phantom tissue and everything else. But that will saturate something superficial very well. The deeper you go, the higher dose you need. So if I was going to treat a stifle joint in a canine, that's going to take a lot higher dose than I'm going to treat the incision that I did the TPLO surgery. So again, you're going to use a higher dosage to get deeper. Uh, and again, this is handled, a lot of it is pre-programmed into your software. And again, it's a place to start. If you use the software and use exactly that dose, and then you reevaluate it in 24 hours, 48 hours or whatever, and you decide that, but I think I should have responded better than that. Well, you increase the dose a little bit, maybe 20%, maybe 50%. You know, a lot of times they said, well, I've treated a bunch of these and they never responded. And I say, hit the button again, <laughs> because you cannot overdose them. And that's another whole lecture on why that's possible, but still. So that's how the dosage is. If you can see it, it's a superficial dose. If you can't see the disorder, you know, for example, the kidney tissue, as you noticed, my doses were a lot higher. And again, almost all this information is included in the software to take the guesswork out of it. You know, because, you know, how do you measure the square centimeters of something? You know, I know because I've been doing it for a long time, but somebody that was just started, again, you know, I think the uh, the software was a great addition to laser therapy. That's, you know, and uh, Mano Medical, I know, because I wrote some of their software. They have the most up-to-date dosages for all their applications that are on there. Thank you very much. And another question related to, uh, to the dosage is, um, I saw you like to use five watts. So the laser we use in the clinic is an AVA laser and we cannot control the wattage. Would that still be as effective? Yes, you just have to. It's all about dose. Wattage determines the, you know, the, um, the basically the amount of photons that are coming out the laser. So if you have a lower wattage or a higher wattage, you know, the photons come out faster or slower. So as long as you're giving the right dose, the cells really don't care how they get it. You know, they don't care if you're treating it, you know, very, you know, saturating that tissue with uh, 5 watts, 10 watts, 15 watts, 20 watts or whatever, or if you're treating it with a 3 or 4 watt laser. You just, it just takes longer to get that dose delivered to the area and it becomes, you know, somewhat of a time restraint when you're treating equine. I mean, you can't spend an hour and a half treating <laughs> the back of a horse. So you have to use a higher powered laser and higher powered lasers, basically the wavelengths that they're at and the power basically provide the deepest penetration and saturation of tissues that, that of anything on the market right now. So you can get those response. It's all about the dose. Calculate the dosage for that area and go by that. And you should, if it doesn't allow you to change the wattage, it should give you a total joule readout. So if you know the area and you know how many joules your, your laser is delivering, that will give you your basically the dosage until you get the right amount. Thank you. Uh, so we will uh, we will take three more questions. So if you have any more questions that we don't have the time to answer, uh, as we mentioned before, please uh, send all laser device related questions to export at medomedical.com and you can sell, send any clinical related questions to Ron's email address displayed on your screen right now. Uh, so yeah, now we uh, I can just share my screen just a second to show the address if you want. Uh, yes. Sure. Yeah, we're tired of looking at the, yeah. the orangutans, so for, I think. For mm -hmm. any question regarding distribution in your country, you can uh, just uh, write to this address. I don't know if you see it now. Uh, yes, we see it. Export. Okay. Not now. And. Yeah. Uh, so I will reply to all your questions regarding the laser or regarding the uh, distribution in your country. Okay, export at manomedical.com. Thank you, Remy. So now we have, so the three last questions that we are going to take are, I believe, very important ones because they 
concern patient safety. So mm -hmm. the first one that uh, I actually see uh, several times in the list is uh, um, what about uh, laser therapy and cancer? Can it be used to fight cancer? Okay, that's a very good question and one that is constant under, constantly under study. So if I have a terminal osteomyelitis, for example, or osteosarcoma rather, you know, if I have a terminal case, how can I not laser it and provide some pain relief? Because it doesn't matter. You know, the, the tumor's there, it's, it's a terminal case. So if for pain relief, palliative care, it is part of the pain management program. But that being said, if you know that there's a tumor, and that's why the first slide of get a diagnosis when possible, if there's a tumor there, what does a tumor want? It wants more food. What does a laser do? It increases the circulation. So it opens up a buffet for the tumor cells. <laughs> so you do not want to know, you know, laser over any kind of tumor. Now there, you know, a lot of other applications for other lasers, not therapy lasers, but treating, you know, photodynamic therapy where you put carbon fibers into the, the uh, tumor and then they're absorbed and destroy the tumor tissue that way. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about therapy lasers. So that is a contraindication and one on the side of prudence. You know, you have to weigh the benefits to the, to the, the you know, the benefits to the, the to what you're gonna get out of the case, what you wanna, where the goal is. But then I know the perpetual question comes up, so I'm gonna beat you to it here. The person, well, what if I don't know there's a tumor there? Well, we can't know everything. And, you know, if you, you know, are checking it regularly, you will see something change or something that would indicate, oh my gosh, we've got something here, which you might not have known if you didn't stimulate it with the laser. I have honestly never lasered an area that I felt it increased the tumor growth. And there are some publications out there that are saying that it does help because you're raising the immune response, you're raising you know, all kinds. It depends on what type of tumor, but terminal care, I absolutely have a big proponent of using it for pain management. Thank you, Ron. Uh, and uh, another question about safety is uh, when using laser to treat the face, ears, mm -hmm. mouth, how do you best ensure that the eyes are not damaged by the laser beam if you don't have protective eyewear for all size animals? What is a sufficient alternative for that? Okay, that's a good question and one that I also get, you have a great audience here because they're getting all the high points here. The, uh, I mean, there's, there's companies that make, that make uh, basically protective eyewear for the patients, but what if you don't have those? I mean, if you don't have those readily available, you have some that don't fit all patients, which is usually what happens. I can tell you right now what really works well is a small hand towel, black, cotton, thick, fold it over four times. And of course, never direct the beam towards the eye itself. So if I hold that towel over there, which most patients tolerate, you know, because you're just putting basically the towel over here. You saw the lens cleaning cloth over the top of the uh, feline that was up in the, the 45 degree angle position. <laughs> that was its eye protection. But of course, look where the laser was. The laser was all the way down in, its, in, in the pelvic area. So we didn't have any chance, you know, exposure, but absolutely eye protection is a must. And I hope that you're wearing protective eyewear and I don't care if it's a class three or a class four laser, you need to have that because all lasers will reflect that beam off and your eye magnifies it 100 times from the time it enters till it hits the retina. So even if you have, well, I have a low level laser and I don't need eye protection, that is absolutely wrong. Yes. Thank you, Ron. And uh, uh, what about um, using laser post-op? Um, mm -hmm. If you use it within the 24 hours after surgery, would that not cause more blood circulation to the area and more hemorrhage? Okay, good question. You must have, you must be assured to yourself that you have a hemostasis in the area. Absolutely. So. You know, honestly, uh, I mean, you if you have any small bleeders in there that you might have missed or that you didn't tie off or that weren't cauterized or however, whatever surgical procedure you did, you will see some seepage coming out of there. So it's kind of a way to self-check yourself. But yes, you're absolutely right. But if you have good hemostasis and you saw, I'm 
those incisions that I showed you on those pictures, you don't really have any seepage or anything like that. And if you do, if it does start swelling up, then you know to basically open back up and, and retie something. So it's kind of a checks and balances, but you know, it's common sense. Yes, you wanna watch while you're doing it. The, where you really get the increased circulation and seepage is when you have an open wound. That dog that had the, all the drains in it and the degloving injury, they said, well, how much should we give? And I said, give it until you can see it, the serum come out of the wound, <laughs> because that way I know the increase in circulation is there. I know that we're getting enough you know, photonic saturation of the tissue. So that's what you want. You want good saturation of the tissue. You want an increased blood supply, because that's why, that's how our incisions heal. And go a little further on that, one question that wasn't asked. Can I laser over a you know stainless steel, titanium rods, plates, screws, wires, all that? Yes, it does not absorb heat. If you doubt my word, take a therapy laser, put it on a bone plate, turn it on its highest setting, on contact to the bone plate and go to lunch. When you come back, the bone plate will be the same temperature. So does it reflect off into the surrounding tissues? Yes. But don't be afraid, you know, you just use it at angles over a bone plate, but don't be afraid of the of those things heating up and causing tissue damage because they will not heat with light. Yes. Thank you, Ron. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, Ron. I think that uh, we will uh, stop taking questions for now because we are already uh, five minutes off the initial time. Uh, so if you have any more questions, please send those by email. Uh, and uh, the replay for this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel shortly, so just uh, uh, probably tomorrow. Um, so some of our audience are, are not English speakers natively. Uh, so for uh, those of them, we for now it will be a little bit complicated to make translated versions, but on, uh, please note that on uh, YouTube, you can activate automated subtitles and uh, sometimes YouTube is pretty much good with that. So we hope that for whoever didn't understand some parts of this lecture, we'll be able to read them in the subtitles. Excellent. So, thank you. Thank you, thank you all very much. Yep. Thank, you thank you all very much for allowing the opportunity here, okay? Thank you. And I'm saying hi to all the distributors that have uh, shared all the link uh, to provide as much uh, as many education that we can worldwide. So I'm saying hi to all of you and thank uh, to all the attendees uh, for staying until the end. So that means that the webinar was really interesting. They had many questions and uh, feel free to contact us and uh, we'll be there to uh, answer all your questions. Again, Ron, that was amazing. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Quite welcome. Good day to everybody. Good, Have day. A good day, everyone. Goodbye.